afternoon, everybody. Um, so just yesterday, um, a very amazing woman released a report, Maria Shriver, yesterday that was groundbreaking. And you're going to hear a little bit more, more about that report in just a moment. Um, basically what Maria did with the Shriver report is she took the pulse of America and what their attitudes were to people with intellectual disabilities. I think it's particularly appropriate because, as you all know, it's the 25th anniversary of the ADA. And as you are no doubt aware, it is also our 2015 World Games. So what a better time. And I would add one more thing. Um, it's also the start of a brand new strategy for Special Olympics. So what better time is there to step back and say, where are we? And what are America's attitudes towards people with intellectual disabilities? And Marie will tell you a little bit more about what her findings are. But essentially, that there are more than about half of Americans who have had some personal contact with people with intellectual disabilities, they're increasingly accepting and positive. But it also ex exposes that the lack of contact, contact with someone with intellectual disabilities has left a legacy of misinformation, dated stereotypes, ignorance, and fear. And I would say, and um, the result of being left out in so many ways, one of which you can hear about that's very important for today, for nearly half of our Americans, when it comes to changing attitudes, towards people with intellectual disabilities, experience, experience is the critical ingredient. So, why is this important? It's important because we need to change the game. And let me explain to you why we feel so incredibly strongly that we need to change the game. All around the world, every single place, including right here in the United States, people with intellectual disabilities are left out of our health care system. showed us have a lifespan that's 16 years less than a person without. And this is not due to the medical condition. It's in so many ways due to misdiagnosis, misinformation, lack of access. All things that should not be the case if there was open access, equitable access to health care. So let me tell you why we know this. As you all know, we are a sports organization. And it's crazy that a sports organization is the largest source of public health care for people with intellectual disabilities. It's crazy. It tells you about the lack of health care. Over the last 15 years, thanks to support from Alisano and others, we've provided 1.6 million health exams. And yes, that provides critical service to our athletes, but it also gives us some really, really important data. So unfortunately, let me tell you the data what the data tells us. Of the 10 athletes, in a rant, you know, a sample, for example, of 10 athletes, what we would find is that four have untreated tooth decay, and one needs an urgent referral to a dentist. Four need eye glasses, and two have some kind of eye disease. Three would fail a hearing test. Two to three would have low, low, low bone density. Five will have significant problems with flexibility and balance. And six of the 10 will be overweight or obese. Six of the 10 will be overweight or obese. Now, one of the benefits of our incredible Healthy Athletes program, you see our founder here today, Steve Furman, um, is yes, we provide the eyeglasses, hearing aids to our athletes that need them. But very, very importantly, we train medical professionals. We serve as a catalyst to train medical professionals. And we've trained over 135,000 medical professionals. So we created, just a few years ago, the reason we created that pilot is we were frustrated because we could, um, we could understand and see what happened to our athletes, but we, when they went back into their communities, they didn't have a problem on care. So we had this idea, and the idea was, could we be a catalyst? Could we take our, our competitions and our games and bring to them the influencers that would then go back to their universities, their businesses, their governments, and their NGOs, and take that message Well, after three years of pilot and 
back and he said, all right, how do we make it bigger? How do we change the world? And so we had this kind of crazy dream. We sat with our closest friends at the Galasana Foundation. They helped us bring all these experts together. And we said, how do we take this that we know works and change the game? So we came back with this crazy idea that we really wanted to make it big. We wanted to go from 14 to 100 healthy communities. And we wanted to expand our Healthy Athletes program. And we thought if we did 100, it would create a tipping point. So we could say to all those other communities, look what's happening here. Why isn't it happening in your own community? And so we're going to tell you in just a few moments about what our friends at Galasano had to say to us and how we think and know that we can go into next year and the years after that with a very different moral than we have today. So I have the privilege now of um, introducing you to someone who probably knows better than any single person in the entire world what the state is for people with intellectual disabilities and someone who is probably better than anyone in the world um, about communicating about it and understanding it. And that is, of course, the person who needs no introduction, Maria Shriver. Well, I'll keep this brief because I know we're here to celebrate uh, uh, a big change in what it comes to healthy communities. But I just want to kind of uh, focus for a minute on the Shriver Report snapshot because it does tell us who we are as a nation, what we think, feel, and believe about people with intellectual disabilities. And that directly, I think, affects the health mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health of people with intellectual disabilities and their families. And what this snapshot, which we did in partnership with the Special Olympics, revealed is that we're a nation divided. We're a nation, half of whom have had direct experiences with people with intellectual disabilities, as Janet said, and half who have not. And the half who have, have very different beliefs, opinions, hopes, and dreams, and experiences because of that contact. The other half are fearful. They don't really even know what an intellectual disability is. They don't know how to forge a relationship, and they're not even sure that they want to. So this tells us we have to uh, increase the amount of people who have experiences with intellectual disabilities. It also tells us that this community, while they're not in institutions like they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, they're still very isolated from the mainstream of the United States. They want to work and the majority of Americans feel they should work, yet only 4% of companies hire them. They want to vote. The majority of Americans think they should not vote. They want to get married. They want to date people. They want to have uh, full, integrated lives. And while Americans think that's a good idea, they don't really know how to go about doing that. So that tells me that we have to do a better job of mainstreaming people with intellectual disabilities, and that starts in the schools, that it, if those young people in schools have experiences in friendship, one of the other things that the poll said is that only 4% or 5% of people actually have a friend with an intellectual disability. So the more we can ex increase contact, the more we can increase experiences, those young people will go on and start to work, they'll hire people with intellectual disabilities. They'll have them as their friends. They'll be in their social circle. So the younger that starts, the better. And the good thing about this poll is it also showed us that millennials are pushing boomers, their parents, to have more open, progressive attitudes, particularly millennial women. So I'm really hopeful the data to show that we have come from some place 25, 30 years ago, but we have a lot more to go. So that's the kind of data that your kids can bring to schools, that you yourself can bring to companies, uh, and that people with intellectual disabilities can bring to their communities. And when we talk about health, I think it's so important that you know we talk here about physical health, but how we feel about our emotional health. If we have a job, we feel you know, seen, we feel like we're contributing, we feel like we're someone. How can we help more people get jobs that increases their emotional health? When you hear the, the global ambassadors talking about what this program has meant to their spiritual health, how they have changed their lives, their families' lives have been changed, all of that, I think, in addition to actually physical health, come under the banner of health. Uh, we all know that because that's how we think of our own health, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, which is why I'm so 
proud that Special Olympics is first and foremost, as, a, as Janet said, a sports program, but that understands you can't play if you don't feel good. You can't stand up and use your voice if you don't feel seen. You can't take care of yourself financially unless you have a job. So one of the things that we're talking about in this social action campaign is to change the game. Every single person here, every single person in the United States, every single person around the world can start changing the game today. And we've come up with an acronym that was up there a minute ago called PLAY, because this is first and foremost a sports organization, and we're saying PLAY. PLAY is where you learn about another person. PLAY unifies. L, learn. Talk to someone with an intellectual disability. Learn about what their life is like. A, accept them. Figure out how they can accept you. Break down the barriers. Open your heart, open your mind to what their life is like and how you have common ground. And say yes. Say yes to being that kind of a person, someone who reaches out across the divide, someone who helps, someone who supports, engage your company, engage your family, engage your community, reach out. So all of us can play. We all need more play in our lives. And we can all be a part of this very simple strategy, which is to change the game. We can wake up, say we don't want to use the R word. We want to play. We want to learn. We want to say yes, and we want to accept. And we understand that people with intellectual disabilities deserve all the same things that we do, those of us who don't have an intellectual disabilities, and that you know, really together, that's how the game gets changed. That's how people have better lives, fuller lives, more complete lives. And so I'm hopeful that people will look at these statistics, that they will remember this acronym, which is really easy, uh, talk to their children about it. Uh, it starts tonight here at the World Games in Los Angeles, the City of Angels. Uh, angels always are playing, so I hope uh, we can think about it that way. And uh, I hope that it will spread across the world. Uh, this is an easy acronym, an easy concept, one that is translatable into all 165 nations that are here today because we must remember that, well, this nation, half of whom do have contacts in most parts of the world, those numbers are much smaller. So thank you, Janet, for uh, working with uh, Shriver Media to put out this snapshot. It ignites change because it has information, it has inspiration, and has a clear call to action, which is what we all need. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maria, for those uh, insightful words and, and really how that aligns to what we're here to talk about today and the importance of making sure we have access and access to health care for our athletes and other people with intellectual disability is, is so important everywhere in the world. To give a snapshot of what that is actually like, it would be no better than to have one of our uh, athletes, one of our international global messengers, to share his journey uh, through life and how his life has been impacted by health and by Special Olympics. So I'd like to introduce our international gold messenger from Special Olympics, Botswana, Brightfield Shady, please. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure being here. My name is Brightfield Shady from Special Olympics, Botswana. I am a living, I am a living example of healthy athletes. Somebody may ask the question, why am I saying that? Because before I used to join Special Olympics, my friends and relatives used to talk about my sight and my intellectuality performance in class. Before I joined Special Olympics, I couldn't even see clearly, and I failed at school because of my sight. After I joined Special Olympics, Healthy Athlete gave me the opportunity to attend the Healthy Athlete where I was assigned to be given glasses to read. And that boosted my confidence. And now I'm able to read and able to do everything. It's like now, I'm able to read the speech that I've been given to present to you. Without Special, without special Olympics Healthy Athlete, I won't be able to do that. And I, won't, I wouldn't be a global messenger. Why? Because my health, my health wasn't taken care of. Because my health has been taken care of, I can do everything because now I can read. I would like to thank Special Olympics Healthy Athlete for that. It will give me a great happiness and hope 
if we could, we athletes, we could have all access to good health and social needs. Special Olympics is doing its best through athlete, through healthy athlete. Sorry for that. It can go as far as allowances allow financially. So let us invest in healthy athlete programs so that we can change the life of the athlete all over the world so that they can live a good life. Without health, we can't do anything better. Look at me, Mina. I'm doing whatever I'm doing because of healthy athletes. As you may hate our hashtag, let's change the game. You won't look any further. Look right here. Today, I have an honor to introduce to you a hero to Special Olympics. Well, ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together to welcome Anne Castellon from the foundation that cares about our health. speaking at a Special Olympics event is never follow an athlete. <laughs> I don't think I really need to say much more that Brightfield didn't already say, except that I'm here because of the Brightfields and the movement. Thank you, Janet and Maria, and thank you all for being here today. The results of your study, Maria, are fascinating and significant to so many facets of our work in this movement. Understanding perceptions is critical if we're to move forward with solutions. And the emphasis on and importance of inclusion is exactly what the Golisano Foundation focuses on in its work. Which brings me to why we are here today. I can't think of a better place or a better time to make this announcement than at this amazing celebration of talents and abilities. The Golisano Foundation is dedicated to supporting services for those with intellectual disabilities and their families. Tom Golisano, the founder and chairman of Paychex, one of the largest payroll and human service processing companies, has a son with intellectual disabilities. So this is a cause that is very near to his heart. He has experienced firsthand how difficult it can be to find the quality care that he needs for his son. For over the past 30 years, the Golisano Foundation has focused its support on organizations in Western New York and Florida, where Tom grew up and where he now lives. Three years ago, however, Tom wanted to make an impact on a larger scale, so we partnered with Special Olympics to launch the Healthy Com Communities Initiative that Janet spoke about earlier. A question we are so often asked, why Special Olympics? They're a sports organization, not a healthcare provider. But as Janet said, here's why Special Olympics. It's because this sports organization is the world's leading global public health organization for people with intellectual disabilities. It's because no other organization comes close to having the infrastructure to assess and address the healthcare needs of people with intellectual disabilities, and because no other organization in the world has the partnerships to break down the barriers to complex health systems to improve quality of care for people with intellectual disabilities. Through its Healthy Athletes program, hundreds of thousands of athletes have received the care that they need, all essential care to leading productive lives, as Brightfield just explained to you. But we said, with Special Olympics, why do people with intellectual disabilities have to get their health care under a tent? What happens after the event? Who is managing their care on a day-to-day -day basis, and where do they go for follow-up treatment? With the Golisano Foundation's first gift of $12 million, we launched healthy communities in 14 pilot countries and states around the world. I'm pleased to report in three short years Barriers have been broken down with insurers, governments, universities, and healthcare providers. 
In three short years, Special Olympics has leveraged additional resources, engaged global partnerships, effectively raised awareness about the health disparities facing and more importantly, has empowered individuals and families through education and grassroots support. So, much has been accomplished and we are encouraged to set our sights even standards, even higher. Words we live by at the Golisano Foundation, which reflect Tom's approach to business and philanthropy, is imagine the possibilities. What would it take to create more healthy communities? By making healthy communities part of its strategic plan, Special Olympics is imagining the possibilities of wealth of what healthcare should be and can be for people with intellectual disabilities. So who better to lead this charge than Special Olympics? So it brings me great pleasure to announce the Golisano Foundation's commitment of $25 million to expand the healthy community program around the world in many, many more countries and states around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I probably should note that this is Special Olympics' largest gift ever received, and this is the largest single gift that Tom Golisano has ever made to an organization. So it truly is a monumental <laughs> gift and day. You need to know that they earned it. They earned it. <laughs> Thank you all. Special Olympics Picture of Success reflects the Golisano Foundation's personal approach when thinking to resolve what seem to be insurmountable challenges, and that is to imagine the possibilities. With this gift, Special Olympics will be able to accelerate their efforts to take healthy communities to transformative scale with inclusive health care for all, ensuring that people with intellectual disabilities are not excluded from healthcare systems in their own community. Only then can people with intellectual disabilities reach their full potential and find pathways to personal dignity and the best possible expressions of their abilities and talents. We are honored to partner with Special Olympics and to provide this financial support. Again, congratulations. We look forward to the next five years. We need all of you to help us this is a big program, $25 million is a tremendous sum of money, but it's not the full amount of this Healthy Communities program. If you have resources, interest, and connections, we'll need your help, and we hope all of you, all of you will join our cause and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, for those incredible words which are literally going to change the world for people with intellectual disability. I'd like to invite Janet back to the microphone to say what this means for our movement. So, um, did you notice that Anne uses wave when she talks about what we're doing with the movement? Um, when Galasano, when Tom and Anne um, invited us to come back and talk, we hadn't even finished the pilot yet. And what Anne and Tom said to us is, demonstrated that we can do something extraordinary. How big can we make it? What will it take? What will it take to truly realize the dream of access to health care for people with intellectual disabilities? So we went away for a long time, and Anne brought in all these resources to help us, and we did all sorts of analysis and data and everything else. We came up with a stream that was massive, and Anne said, don't be afraid to dream, right? Just don't be afraid of it. Let's dream the big dream. So we did. And when we sat down with them and the size and scale of this, they said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to more than imagine the possibilities. We're going to capture the possibilities. And for once, for once, we can change the world. We can truly, with this size and scale, change the world and create a tipping point to create real equity and access to health care because our athletes deserve it. People with intellectual disabilities deserve it, and the time is now. So thank
thanks to this gift from Anne. The time is now. As she said, we need all of you for sure um, because it gets us a lot of the way there, but we have a long, long way to go. Uh, so we're here at the, at the beginning and at the middle and the end, I said to Anne earlier. And I think that on behalf of all of us in the movement, we can't begin to thank Anne and Tom enough. I think the only way we can thank them enough is to truly create equal access to health care for people with intellectual disabilities. So please join me in thanking Anne, and please join us in the road ahead. Thank you, guys.